When elements combine together to form compounds, one type of compound is called a molecular compound. A molecular compound is made of nonmetals that are held together by sharing electrons. The basic unit of a molecular compound is a molecule, and a molecule is a neutral group of atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. Remember from the previous screencast that covalent bonds involve two different atoms sharing electrons. Sometimes these electrons are shared equally, and sometimes they are shared unequally. When we write chemical formulas for molecular compounds, they are written as molecular formulas. A molecular formula uses element symbols and subscripts to indicate all of the atoms that are present in a single molecule. So for example, a water molecule has two hydrogens and one oxygen, and so we write it as a formula H2O. Sucrose is a type of sugar which has the chemical formula C12H22O11. And an oxygen molecule is actually a diatomic molecule which has the formula O2. All of these are examples of molecular formulas because they show the exact elements present in each molecule. Keep in mind from the last chapter that individual atoms have a very high potential energy. They are not stable with their given number of valence electrons and therefore have a high potential to combine with other atoms. When atoms bond together, they will have a lower amount of potential energy than the original individual atoms. Over to the right is a potential energy diagram for individual atoms. You can see that the atoms off to the right have a high amount of potential energy associated with them. The potential energy is represented by this purple line. As those atoms combine together and become closer to each other, the amount of potential energy drops and is lower than it was initially. The distance between those two bonded atoms depends on a couple of different factors. The electron-proton attraction, as well as the electron-electron repulsions, and the proton-proton repulsions. So if you look at a compound with two atoms in it, the nucleus of one atom is represented in black on the right, and the other atom is represented in black on the left. And there is a repulsion between those two sets of protons. There is also a repulsion between their electrons. But the protons of one atom are attracted to the electrons of the neighboring atom. The combination of those factors determines the bond length of the covalent bond. Bond length is defined as the distance between the atoms that has the minimum amount of potential energy. So again, you see another potential energy diagram showing atoms combining together. Over here marked with number one, you have two individual atoms that have a high amount of potential energy. As those atoms get closer together at number two, the amount of potential energy drops. As the atoms get closer together yet, the potential energy drops even more. But now notice if I try to push the atoms together even closer, the amount of potential energy actually rises because now I've got greater repulsive forces than I do attractive forces. So this point here at the bottom of the graph, labeled with number three, represents the distance that's going to have the minimum amount of potential energy. There is a pattern between bond lengths and the size of atoms. Bigger atoms tend to have larger electron clouds, and therefore their bonds will be longer. Hydrogen is one of the smallest atoms on the periodic table. A hydrogen molecule has a bond length of 74 picometers. Fluorine is also a relatively small atom, but because it has more electrons in its electron cloud, it's going to have a slightly longer bond length of 141 picometers. If I compare fluorine and chlorine, they're both halogens, they're both in the same group, but chlorine is below fluorine on the table. So because it's lower in the group, it's going to have a larger atomic radius and therefore will require a longer bond length of 199 picometers. When we form these chemical bonds, energy is released because the molecules have a lower amount of potential energy than the individual atoms. So remember the two hydrogen atoms in the potential energy diagrams that we saw on the previous slide had a higher amount of potential energy than a hydrogen molecule combined together. Potential energy is kind of analogous to a ball on a staircase. As the ball rolls down the stairs, it loses potential energy until it arrives at the bottom. As hydrogen atoms get closer together, 
their amount of potential energy decreases until they form that hydrogen molecule with a lower amount of potential energy. The difference between the potential energy of the individual hydrogen atoms compared to the hydrogen molecule is the amount of energy that will be released when that bond is formed. That amount of energy is known as the bond energy. That same amount of energy must be added in order to break those chemical bonds. Going back to my staircase analogy, if the ball is at the bottom of the staircase and I want to kick it up to the top, I would have to apply a certain amount of energy with my foot to kick that ball up to a higher potential energy level. The same is true for molecules. If I have a hydrogen molecule, which has a low amount of potential energy, and I want to break it apart into individual hydrogen atoms, I would have to apply that same amount of bond energy to the chemical bond in order to break it. So breaking bonds requires energy to be added, whereas forming chemical bonds releases energy. There is an inverse relationship between the bond length and the bond energy. Atoms that have a very small bond length require a big amount of energy in order to break them, whereas atoms that have a very long bond length have a weaker attraction between the nuclei and therefore require less energy in order to break them. We can represent different kinds of molecular compounds using a format called a Lewis structural formula. When drawing Lewis structural formulas, each atom in the molecule is represented with a dot diagram, where the dots around the outside of the atom symbol represent the number of valence electrons. All of the elements in group 1, the alkali metals, have one valence electron. So if I were to draw a dot diagram for any of those elements, they would have one dot on the outside of their element symbol. Whereas all of the elements in the halogen group, group 17, have seven valence electrons. So they will have seven dots surrounding their element symbol. We then take these different dot diagrams and we combine them together to make a Lewis structural formula. The structural formula shows how the atoms are connected to one another using dots and dashes. So for example, for a water molecule, which is H2O, each hydrogen atom has one valence electron because it's in group 1. An oxygen atom has six valence electrons because it's in group 16. I can combine those dot diagrams together to form a Lewis structure, which can either be made up of all dots or a combination of dots and dashes where the dashes represent the covalent bonds and the dots on the top and bottom represent the unshared electrons. When drawing structural formulas, the most important rule is the octet rule. Atoms can combine together to form an octet of valence electrons by sharing these electrons. So for example, a fluorine molecule is made by combining together two fluorine atoms. Each fluorine atom is a member of the halogen group and will have seven valence electrons. We can then combine those together so that each fluorine actually has an octet of electrons around the outside. The fluorine on the left has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 valence electrons. The two electrons in the middle are being shared by both atoms so that they each have 8 valence electrons. There are a few exceptions to the octet rule. The most notable exception is hydrogen. Hydrogen is actually stable with only two valence electrons. And this is because when its 1s sublevel is completely full, it will only have two electrons. So up here is an example of a hydrogen dot diagram with one dot on the outside of the hydrogen. In the middle here is a hydrogen molecule with two hydrogen atoms sharing two electrons each. And over here on the right is an example of a hydrogen chloride molecule where the hydrogen only needs two electrons around it in order for it to be stable, but the chlorine needs eight electrons around it in order to be stable. Another exception to the octet rule is boron. Boron is stable with six valence electrons. So you can see in the diagram to the right that a boron molecule will often have three dashes surrounding it, where each dash represents two electrons. So two, four, six total electrons around a boron atom. It is also possible for some elements to have more than eight electrons. These elements include phosphorus, sulfur, and even xenon, which will often combine together to have 10 or even 12 electrons surrounding it. There are many compounds that combine together to form molecules that have multiple covalent bonds. In the examples that we've seen previously, 
all of the molecular compounds had single bonds, where two atoms are sharing one pair of electrons, which is represented by a single dashed line. It is also possible to have a double bond, where two atoms share two pairs of electrons. This is represented by two lines between two atoms. Lastly, it's possible to have triple bonds. Triple bonds will share three pairs of electrons and will therefore have three dashes between two different atoms. Having multiple covalent bonds affects the bond length and bond energy of the atoms. The bond length is generally shorter with multiple atoms. When only one pair of electrons is being shared, the nuclei are separated by a distance that has the lowest amount of potential energy. But when two atoms are sharing two pairs of electrons, the nuclei of the two atoms are held together tighter and closer, causing a shorter bond length. So for example, a carbon-carbon single bond has a bond length of 154 picometers, and a carbon-carbon triple bond is 120 picometers. Remember that bond length is inversely proportional to bond energy, so the shorter the bond length, the more energy is required to break those chemical bonds. So a carbon-carbon single bond requires 346 kilojoules to break it apart, whereas a carbon-carbon triple bond requires 835 kilojoules.